Well, it's my pl pleasure to share with you guys God's word this morning. Uh, kind of a sudden deal. You guys heard Michael and Trisha are both stuck in their homes for a little while here, and they're trying not to spread the Rona around to other people. And so they're... Um, uh, Michael called me Friday and said, hey, I'll send you some of my notes and uh, you can just do with it what you will. And I was like, all right, we'll come up with something. And so if I say anything uh, meaningful or important this morning, it's probably Michael's notes. And if I say anything silly, it's probably mine. So just so you know, we'll blame it on him. I don't know about you, but these last two Sundays about prayer, if you were here, man, God has just been speaking to me through the words of Michael Sweet. Our, our pastor is a powerful speaker, and he has a passion for God's word. Uh, could you turn my mic down just a hair? It's just a little ringing up here. Um, he has a passion for God's word like I've never seen. Just loves, loves God's word. And any of you guys that uh, sit, get, have the pleasure of sitting and talking with him about God's word in, his, in the office or whatever, just, I mean, he, he is genuine. He's 100% loves teaching God's word, and we are blessed as a congregation to have someone like him share. Um, and so with that said, I feel a little nervous this morning, kind of following him up these last two weeks. He's just been on it, on point. And so we're in the middle of uh, our word for the, the winter is authentic, right? We've been talking about what it means to be authentic, and there's a lot of different definitions of the word authentic, right? We, we, as we apply it to our life, we, we say things like, uh, you know, I have an authentic gold coin, right? And we would mean that it's, it's not fake. It's not a false gold coin. It's a real gold coin, you know? And so that kind of helps us understand what being an authentic Christian. We, we could also say this, this piece of art is authentic, and what would we mean by that? It's, it's not a copy. It's not a duplicate. It was an original made by that, that person. But as I was thinking about this word authentic, I wanted us to stretch our brains a little bit more because I think when it comes to prayer and we apply this word authentic to it, it's a little bit more like authentic food. And when we go and we want authentic Thai food, what we're asking for, what we're asking of that restaurant is to get us as close to the original as we possibly can, right? We want it to be like what we would get if we went to Thailand. That's what we would want if we had authentic um, Thai food. You know, if we want authentic Mexican food, we wouldn't go to Taco Bell, right? We would, <laughs> we would go find authentic Mexican food, not American Mexican food, right? And so that's, that's kind of what this thing, when it comes to prayer, we want to be authentic. We want to go back and get as close to what the founder with the originator had in mind. And thankfully for us, God, Jesus, gave us a prayer to pray. And that's what we've been studying these last few weeks. And we can go back and we can go, let's be as close to what he taught us to pray so we can be authentic in our prayers. We can be genuine. We can be just like how he wanted it to be. And so the last couple of weeks we've been talking about authentic prayer and how it was empowered by the gospel. That was our first week. We talked about how Jesus, our God, is our daddy, our Abba Father. And we talked about the opening of that, um, that prayer and just that powerful relationship that we get to have with Jesus and the, the significance of that. And then the second week, uh, we get, kind of went into the practical advice of, for engaging in prayer, how to be in community, how to pray together. Um, and how to lift up our prayers and requests to God. And we talked about uh, forgiving our, our uh, sins and our providing our daily bread in the Lord's Prayer. We went through that. So this week, we want to kind of dive into uh, the, the, what, I, what we're calling missional part of the prayer, where we can go out and be missional. We can see the kingdom of God happen through our prayers. And we're going to be focusing on that uh, verse 10 part of the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to read the whole Lord's Prayer to us again. Matthew 6, 9 through 15. Let's read this. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive us forgiven our debtors. And lead us not 
into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And so, how many, as I was reading that, how many of you guys have that memorized? Do you think you have that? Like, I mean, we've all said it over and over again. We do it at communion here, and we, we, we know the Lord's Prayer. But it's so important to sit down and reflect on what this prayer actually means. And uh, uh, again, like I said, those last couple of weeks have just, uh, re- God's really got a hold of my heart in some powerful ways because of this prayer and what it's supposed to be. But I want us, as we focus in, kind of on verse 10 uh, today, it's your kingdom come, your will be done. God has a kingdom that he is wanting to set up here on earth. That's what we can get from this verse. He literally wants to do something in our lives. He wants to manifest a kingdom in our lives because uh, that's what he came here to do. And we get to have a part of that. We get to ask for that to happen. That's what he wants us to pray for. And that's what's awesome. Each one of us in here is called on a mission. We have a mission for our lives with the gifts that God's given us. We are called by God. We are loved by God. And we are known by God. Every one of us in here. We are equipped by God to do his work. That's an important thing. We are on his team. And it's almost as if back in the day, Jesus had come and he's using language like he's setting up his kingdom. And that's a little harder for us to understand, but it would be like someone coming in today and saying, you know what? The government model that you guys have in America is kind of messed up. And we want to set up a new system. I'm going to set up a new form of government and I want you to be involved in it. I want you guys to be the ones ruling and running and and making things happen in this kingdom that I'm gonna be set up, in this government structure. I want you to be a dictator, I want you to be a a, a representative, I want all, all of you guys to be part of this kingdom that I'm setting up. And he's called and he's equipped each one of us to do that. But he doesn't just call us to do this. He, he, wants, he gives us a secret weapon, the main weapon. It's a superpower that he gives each one of us. And he gives us prayer, the ability to talk directly to him. And so as I was thinking about this sermon this week, what I want to get into is our, what is the kingdom prayer look like? How does kingdom prayer affect our lives? And we're going to answer some of those questions. But before we jump into it, I want to start with an illustration from a movie I saw called We Were Soldiers. Really good movie. Um, I wouldn't recommend it if you're not a violent movie kind of person. And uh, so I just want to clarify that up. Don't don't just watch it because the pastor said so. Okay. It's kind of a violent movie, but uh, Mel Gibson does a great job Uh, representing faith and the soldiers and fighting for freedom and fighting for faith and and just an incredible representation of it. But the basic premise of the movie is all these soldiers are in Vietnam and they're um, fighting. They get landed behind enemy lines and they have to make contact with this group of Viet Cong soldiers and they uh, they thought there was a couple hundred there. They were supposed to fight them, and it turned out there was a couple thousand of them, and they were all pouring in, and it was a, it was a big deal. And so they were outnumbered 10 to 1. They're, they're stuck back in here. And one of the platoons, a small group of soldiers, gets separated from the rest of them. And they're out on this hill, um, up on this little knoll, kind of pinned down in the brush, in the jungle, pinned down, and they can't get up. If they get up for any reason, they'll get shot and killed because there's so many of the, the enemy soldiers and they know they're there. And so they're, uh, they're just stuck there, right? And so they defend themselves for a while, but they run out of ammo up on top of the hill. And they're going to try to figure out how, do we, how are we going to survive? These soldiers just keep coming in by the hundreds up this hill to get us. And they had the secret weapon. They had what the radio guy was there. The radio operator was there, and he was able to call in miles away, people they couldn't see, miles and miles away, they were able to call in artillery to defend their position. So every time the soldiers would come pouring up the hill, they would call in an artillery strike, and it would level out this thing, a massive display of firepower, and the, the enemy would have to fall back, and then they would try again. And over the course of this 
hour-long movie as these soldiers keep coming in and they keep being defended by this artillery from these people they haven't seen, right? And so this radio operator is the only guy on that thing that's really ba basically saving their lives. They have no ammo left. They have no way to defend themselves. If these soldiers make it up to that hill to get to them, they would be wiped out, right? And, and this is the illustration I want us to, to see when it comes to prayer. The power of us being able to talk to, directly to God, has incredible impact in the scenarios that happen right in front of us. These soldiers, they couldn't see the, the artillery shells being loaded. They couldn't see what was going on. All they knew is that, hey, we need help. These guys are coming. And all of a sudden, in front of them, big impacts happened. And that's exactly what prayer is like for us. We don't see what all goes on. And, and in fact, we have to have faith that God's loading the cannons, right? Just like those soldiers had to, they had to trust that, man, these guys are going to catch our backs, right? They're going to they're gonna be on their door. They're not going to fall asleep while we're, we're talking to them. We have to have faith that God is going to get our back. And that's what missional kingdom prayer does. It has impact in our life and the life that we see. God wants to do big things in our life. And when we pray, something is unleashed in the spiritual realm. And there is power behind what we do. So the first thing I want to look at is that prayer is a powerful, offensive tool to see the kingdom of God be set up in our lives. Prayer is a powerful, offensive tool to see the kingdom of God being set up in our lives. When we pray... We literally get to see God's plans take shape here on earth. They're formed in front of us. It's an incredible thing. So what is the kingdom of God that we're trying to see take place? And I, I want to just take a, a little bit of a side. We're going to go through three points on what is this kingdom that we're praying for. If we're saying, God, your kingdom come... What exactly are we asking God to do? And so I want to just quick overview kind of what the kingdom of God is. And we're going to actually spend the next weeks unpacking the kingdom of God. Uh, Michael and I have a three-week kingdom of God series, and we're going to unpack this a little more. But I do want to just kind of hit briefly, if we're asking God for his kingdom to come, we kind of should be knowing what we're praying for, right? That would be a good thing uh, to ask him for. And so the first thing is this, the first perspective as we look at Jesus' teachings on the kingdom of God, uh, we can look at and see what he said. And the first thing he kind of talked about a lot was that the kingdom of God is inverted. And you guys have probably, some of you have probably heard this concept before, but uh, he always was flipping things upside down. You know, when you read Jesus' teachings, he's always talking about, hey, the strong, it's not the strong who will be the leaders in my kingdom. It's the meek. It's the humble. And it's like, well, that's opposite of what we see in in, in earthly kingdoms, it's the meek, not the strong. It's not the, the proud. It's not the arrogant who are in charge. It's the humble. And he's just constantly flipping these around. It's not the person who wants to be first in my kingdom. It's the person who chooses to be last. It's not the person who wants to be the greatest it's the person who chooses to be a servant of all. And this is what we're praying for. So when we're praying and saying, God, would, you, would your kingdom come? We're asking him to flip our thoughts upside down. Instead of us being seeking to be strong, proud, first, and the greatest, we're asking him to make us meek, humble, and a servant to those around us. And we're asking that for our marriages. We're asking that for our workplaces. We're asking that for our families, for our kids. How can we have the kingdom of God come? And so the first perspective as we see the kingdom of God coming to place is that it's inverted. It's upside down from what the world would say a kingdom should be. We are asking God to make his life evident in these areas. The second perspective I want to look at 
about the kingdom when we pray this prayer is that we are included in the kingdom of God. Jesus talks about this all the time when he's using parables. He's like, he uses words like, you are responsible. You are in charge. You are stewards over the things I give you in this kingdom. And he has some pretty intense words for people who are, on, uh, uh, who are in charge of his kingdom. And, and we are called to serve in his kingdom. It's kind of like, almost like military service. I, I like to think of it. We haven't done uh, uh, a draft in years and years in this country, right? But it would be as if your country is calling on you to go serve. I, I want you to be a part of serving this country. And that's what Jesus is doing. He wants us to be part of the process of seeing his kingdom come. And I think that's such a, an awesome thing to know. Uh, Jesus is uh, teaching uh, when he talks about this. He, he talks about the idea of stewardship. Uh, he, he gifts the different um, tenants different amounts of money. Do you guys remember that passage of scripture where he says, hey, this tenant, I'm going to give 10 uh, amounts of money to, and this one gets five, and this one gets one, right? And they each have a responsibility to handle what God's given them. They all have uh, a responsibility to do. And the one handles that with excellence, makes it grow, takes what God's done and, and uses it for his glory. And then the second one does the same thing, but he has less stuff. And then the last one chooses to do nothing with it, right? And God has severe consequences for those tenants, those managers who choose to waste God's talents, and so as we look at the kingdom of God, we realize, hey, we're responsible. We're part of this. When we ask God's kingdom, when we pray and say, God, your kingdom come, and we choose not to be responsible and not to do things with excellence, we are held responsible for that. And there is some pretty severe consequences for not following him. And there's severe, there's uh, pretty intense rewards for those who choose to obey and follow him. And so this is, this is a pretty big deal. This isn't when you get invited into the kingdom of God. It's not like, all right, well, I'm just going to sit back, hang out, do whatever I want to do for the next 70 years, and then I'm going to go to heaven with Jesus, right? Jesus isn't calling us to just chill out and wait for, wait for death so we can go to heaven and just enjoy our life. He wants us to enjoy our life following him doing what he's called us to do and getting on the path. And there are some pretty severe consequences and some pretty uh, awesome rewards for those of us that can choose to do that. We are part of that process. I love seeing how God plays this out in the Old Testament in Hezekiah's prayer. And this is from 2 Kings um, chapter 6, verse 20, and he's talking to Hezekiah, uh, uh, and Hezekiah is the king at the time. And verse 20, I'll read, In those days Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Get your house ready, because you're going to die. You will not recover. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, Remember, Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and wholeheartedly devotion, and have done what is good in your eyes. And then Hezekiah whipped, wept bitterly. Before Isaiah left the middle room of the court, the word of the Lord came to him. Go back and tell Hezekiah, the ruler of my people, this is what the Lord God says. I have heard your prayer and I have seen your tears and I will heal you. And on the third day you will go up to the temple of the Lord and I will add 15 years to your life and you will deliver this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. And so it's real fascinating that it's like a clear word from the Lord. Guess what? You're sick. You ain't getting better. You're about to die. And, and God just, or Hezekiah just gets down on his knees and says, God, I, this, is, this is just terrible. I, I've done everything. I've followed you. And God listens to him and adds 15 years to his life. That's pretty crazy. The power of a prayer, one simple prayer saying, God, man, I've, I followed you. I've done what you've told me to do. Would you, would you add years to my life? And he does. It's an incredible, incredible thing. We have power in our prayers when they are 
kingdom prayers as we seek and follow him. As the world looks at us, they ought to be able to see these things playing out, right? We should have power. As our prayers are powerful, we should be able to show the rest of the world what it is that God is doing. The last thing I want to look at uh, this morning about the kingdom of God, when we think about the kingdom of God and what it is, what we're asking God, would your kingdom come? Would your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Uh, that the kingdom of God runs on a currency called faith. The last thing is that the currency in the kingdom of God is faith. It's almost as if it, it's like a monetary system. Here in America, we use uh, the dollars, right, to, to buy and sell things. We, you want to go down and buy a new pickup. You want to buy something cool. You got to have money. That's how you get, get things done, right? You, you, you want to see something really cool happen? The more money you have, the more things you can buy, right? That's just how the world works. And that's the monetary system that, the, that our country is set up on. The kingdom of God is set up on a monetary system that runs on faith. And the cool thing about it is what does Jesus teach about this faith? If you have faith the size of a mustard seed you can move mountains. In other words, we don't need much faith to run on this monetary system. He gets excited when we have faith the size of a mustard seed. Now, I have a little little crumb that I I whittled down to the size of a mustard seed. I couldn't find a mustard seed in the last two days. But I don't know if you can see it on there. It's probably not. It's probably almost impossible to see, right? It's this tiny little fleck that I, I tried to get it as close to the uh, mustard seed as I could. This is how much faith we need in order to move mountains in this system. In other words, God's saying, you can do this. If you put your trust in me, because it, it isn't about you having the superpower weapon, you having the power to change your scenario. It's not about you having the ability to make all these things come true in your life. It's about him having it. And all we need to know is that we can connect with him and talk with him and say, God, I'm with you. This is what you've told me to do. This is what you've asked me to do. And I'm going to stand in faith. And sometimes I don't have very much faith. My faith is small. But you promised that if I stand there, if I stand my ground, we can see mountains move. And so we do stand in faith. When we pray, things are going on that we cannot see. You guys, there is a spiritual realm out there. And sometimes we get so busy with what's going on physically in front of us that we miss there is a spiritual battle going on all the time. We look at our our relationship with God sometimes as if it's all just this beautiful, flowery, good thing. And we miss that there's mortars flying over our head. There's bullets going everywhere and that the enemy is real. We go to the latter part of the the Lord's Prayer uh, in verse 13. And it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. God He's literally telling us to pray for defense, and prayer is our defense. We're asking God, God, would you spare us from the attacks of the enemy? Because they are real, and they are evident, and they will come. When we have faith and can pray in faith, we know that God will answer, and that he will defend us when challenges come. One of my favorite Old Testament stories is the last story from the Bible I'll read, and then I have an illustration, we'll be done. But this story from Elijah and Gehazi, his servant, they were surrounded by an enemy army. You guys heard this story before, right? Surrounded by an enemy army in their city. The soldier, the enemy army heard about Elijah because his prophecy, his connection with God was so good that he could tell what the enemy's movements were before 
they knew what the, the enemy knew what their movements were, right? And so their defense tactics were impeccable because they knew exactly what the enemies were doing. And so they said, we got to take out this Elijah dude. We found out where he's staying. Let's surround him. So they get over there. They set up their army. They encamp around them. The next morning, they're going to attack. And they wake up, and this is what happens. Don't be afraid. Oh, said the, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed to his servant who was with him. He said, Lord, open his eyes so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw his full hills full of horses and chariots all around Elisha. As the army came down toward him, Elijah prayed to the Lord, strike the army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elijah had asked him to do. Elijah told them, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. After they entered the city, Elijah said, Lord, open their eyes so they can see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and they were inside the city, right? So God basically captured this enemy army inside the city they were supposed to be taking, right? When he struck them with blindness. Incredible story. But there's that moment where the servant who's next to Elijah gets to see for the first time with faith eyes what God is doing what the power of what he has going on. Prayer is a powerful deal. And there is a spiritual army out there for both good and for evil that is wreaking havoc in our lives and in our marriages and in our families. And it, we are called to pray for the defense of our family. Be praying that God would stand up and defend us, that he would deliver us from the evil one. I want to end with this question. Why, if prayer is so important, why do we always use prayer as a last resort? Maybe not you, but, but me. We use prayer as a last resort. Oh, God, I can't figure this out, God. Would you help me? Well, you could have started with that. Right? But we always, ah, I've tried, I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried. Okay, now I need God. And God's wondering, this is, this is your powerful weapon. This is your direct line of communication with the God of the universe. Last week I was on a chaplain call out to Reed Point. A little three-year-old boy was killed accidental, ran over by his dad. Horrendous story. I know you guys have heard this. And, and I got the call and was like, God, what am I going to do? How am I going to minister to this family? And driving out there, uh, just my heart just broke. And I thought, how? God, what am I going to do? And he just put it in my mind. He said, you should call Lauren Eater. That's his church. That's his community out there. And, and I was like halfway there, and I didn't have service. I didn't have service. Oh, all right, God, I'm going to try. And, and it broke. It was right, right when I was getting on the interstate off Springtime Road. I called Lauren Eater, and I said, Lauren, now I've called him before on chaplain calls in Reed Point, and, and you know, he was either you know, doing stuff in Billings or he had refer refing and lots of other busy stuff, and he just couldn't make it. But this time I called him. I said, Lauren, I need your help, buddy. This is going to be a, a tough one. And I don't know what to say and, and uh, how I'm going to do this. And he said, hey, I just saw your vehicle. I'm just getting off. I'll, I'll follow you out there. And he was, he was right there. He was right at the right spot. And I know it's something small, but God's faithfulness of having Lauren walk in that scene with me and be able to sit with that dad and that dad look up and go, Pastor Lauren, I'm so glad you're here. I need you here. And for us to just sit on the floor and cry with this man, and realize that, ah, man, life is precious, but, but to know that God hears our prayers and that he answered that prayer of sending Lauren, the man that needed to be there in that room with that family at that moment. God is good. He answers. And I don't, I don't know why terrible things happen like that, but, but we can know that somehow God is, is working behind the scenes.
So be praying, people. Let's be praying. Lift up each other. Lift up your spouse. Lift up your family. Lift up this country. Be people of prayer this week. And with that said, let's pray. God, we just ask that you, man, help us live in the attitude and the spirit of prayer. As we study scripture, we realize that prayer isn't always words even sometimes. Sometimes it's just an anguished heart. Sometimes our prayer is just brokenness. And so God, just help us as we pray continually. That we pray without ceasing all of the challenges that we face. All of the struggles that we face help us to have boldness and faith. Because you are good and you will answer us. God, help us to be a people of prayer in this church. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen.